In chapter five, we're gonna have a brief look at the topic of random number generation, because although Monte Carlo methods are not the main focus of this course, um, we have seen them creeping in in, uh, in various different places, um, because in reality, it's hard to do much serious statistical computing without you know, occasionally getting involved with uh, some Monte Carlo methods uh, of one form or another. And so understanding simulation, understanding random number generation, understanding Monte Carlo methods um, is really a fundamental part of understanding statistical computing better. But so far, we've just been taking it for granted that um, we have a reliable source of random numbers that we can generate IID random quantities from, you know, more or less uh, any standard distribution that we're interested in. Um, but, you know, how, how do we do that? Where does that come from? It turns out that that's not a trivial problem. Um, so the way that we deal with this on a computer, you know, computers are typically fundamentally deterministic machines. And so we don't really generate random numbers. We generate pseudo random numbers, which are deterministic sequences that look random and ideally look uh, completely indistinguishable from a random sequence. We break the problem down by first tackling the problem of how to generate uniform not one random quantities. Uh, and we make sure that our algorithm works and does indeed generate uniform not one random quantities and then given a source of uniform not one random quantities we can then think of the problem as how can we transform uniform not one random quantities to other distributions that i'm interested for example you know gaussian poisson you know gamma whatever yeah so we we have two separate issues now one is the random number generation issue which is what we're going to focus on now where does that source of uniform not ones come from and then a different problem is how do we turn uniform not ones into other distributions of interest yeah and we'll touch very very briefly on that but that's that's not what we're going to focus on we're going to focus mainly on the problem of how do we get uniform not one random deviates and what are the issues Well, how do you even begin to think about this problem? If computers are fundamentally deterministic machines, then how can you, you know, ever hope to get uh, random numbers out of them? Well, you just come up with a, a sequence that looks random. And there are lots of ways you can do that. So let's start with um, a simple linear congruential generator. So how do they work? Well, the equation here is the key. You want to generate a sequence of numbers. So you have a rule for generating an xi plus one from an xi, and you come up with a rule and you see what the implications of that rule are. So in a linear congruential generator, what you have is a linear operation. That is you multiply xi by a number, you maybe add another number and look at it modulo some other number. And so that is clearly going to give you a sequence of, uh, if you start with an integer at least, a sequence of integers uh, from 0 up to m minus 1 and um, it may or may not look random depending on your choices of a, b and m. Um, given that sequence of integers, suppose that that sequence of integers looked random, uh, what could you do? You could then define ui to be just xi over m. That's now going to give you a sequence of rational numbers on the interval 0, 1, and that sequence of rational numbers um, will look uh, like uniform 0, 1 random variables as long as your integers were uniformly distributed over the integers 0 to mod m. All right, so that is the idea behind linear congruential generators. Of course, the question is how do you choose a, b, and m to get a random looking sequence? Well, what you might want is to get full period, right? So um, what do I mean by that? Well, clearly, um, if you're looking at integers mod m, there are only m different values you could possibly have. Uh, and so because this is a deterministic sequence, the best you could possibly hope for is you visited each of those m integers once and then got back to where you started and then cycled around again. Yeah. So a, a generator of this form could only 
possibly have a maximum period of m but of course it might have a period much shorter than that it might revisit a, another number it's visited before uh, way before you get to m and then uh, it will cycle around that loop forever all right so thinking about the period of your generator is obviously very important you want it to have a, a longer period as possible um, but with these congruential generators the uh, the most you could hope for is m um, so how would that work um, well, actually, it's it's quite difficult to to determine um, in in full generality. Uh, but there are a number of theoretic methods you can often use to analyze these generators. Uh, but the point is that even if you uh, manage to achieve that, uh, you're not guaranteed a good generator. So here's a nice infamous example called the Randu generator, which uh, really was supplied as the random number generator with uh, with the uh, some some old computers um and it and it had um that property that um the successive values appeared uncorrelated and the uh and um the generator had full period all right so here here it is okay it looks like a perfectly uh reasonable thing to do you take your x you multiply it by a big number you look at it modulo another big number and that gives you the next number in your sequence yeah uh, so that seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to do if you just implement that. So here it is implemented um, and you rescale the x's by dividing by m minus 1 to get a sequence of random numbers uh, u. Uh, you can then plot them and in particular you could do a qq plot of them against the normal, uh, against sorry, the uniform uh, expectations and you see a nice straight line so it looks all uniform so that's all good what else could you do to check that this uh, random number generator looked okay well you could just look at the plot of one value against the next because you'd hope that they were uh, independent or at least uncorrelated okay so if you do that plot uh, at the top here um, again it all looks pretty good you're getting a nice uniform scattering of numbers on the unit square that's exactly what you would want to see the problem comes actually when you start looking at triples and of course one of the complications here is it's quite hard to visualize things in 3D um, but if we use a, a 3D plot and we plot that that's starting to look a little bit funny it's maybe not looking quite so uniform over that cube um, so maybe if we uh, mess about with that cube tilt it a little bit we can see what's going on um, and we do and we see that um, actually this generator has a horrible property that um, all of the values lie on one of um, a small number of planes. Uh, those planes you can see are not actually aligned with one of the axes so uh, you wouldn't notice this problem if you just looked um, at any two uh, coordinates but um, when you look at it in three-dimensional space you realize it's really not covering that three-dimensional space very well at all and that is going to be a problem why is it going to be a problem well we've seen that one of the advantages of monte carlo over quadrature is it uses randomness to scatter uh, points um, often uniformly over the space of interest um, but if you have this problem with your random number generator that is clearly not scattering points uniformly over your your space of interest and so that is going to lead to problems when you start using these random numbers particularly if you're doing high dimensional integrals right that is immediately going to uh, be a problem that you're really not covering three dimensional space very well okay so that's a just a good illustration of the fact that you can come up with a perfectly reasonable looking uh, rule to generate random numbers it can look fine in 1d it can look fine in 2d uh, but actually in high dimensions suddenly uh, it reveals problems that's not to say that the whole idea of linear congruential generators is uh, terrible actually uh, you can get some perfectly reasonable linear congruential generators so here's a better one right so if you want some other magic numbers a b and c uh, well here's one and um, you know the, the corresponding triples plot you see you're getting that much more uniform uh, 
distribution over three dimensional space. Of course, that's not to say that if you looked in four or five or six dimensional space, you wouldn't see problems. Um, but there's a whole uh, batch of tests that you can apply to your random number generator, which tries to look for the various different slightly subtle ways that your random number generator can fail. Uh, so one example of these tests is the so-called uh, diehard battery of tests. And that just takes your random number generator sequences and, uh, you know, looks at various different statistics of that sequence to look for any evidence of uh, non-uniformity. Yeah, so that's a, a, you know, a, a very vital thing that you do with any proposed new random number generator is you submit it to a, a range of tests to look for any evidence that it's really deviating from IID uniform. Okay, but if you continue to look at these generators, right, you see that um, this one like has the problem that if you start with a very small X, it might be for, followed by another small X. Um, but that isn't really what you would want to happen necessarily. So a, a lot, most of the linear congruential generators that you can uh, that you can concoct will have some uh, feature like this that is not not totally desirable so um and in particular in high dimensional spaces they can all have this uh, this tendency to uh, to lie on you know a finite number of planes in some higher dimensional space and it might not be three space but it um, but it might still be a problem that reveals itself in high dimensional settings. So um, you can come up with reasonable linear congruential generators. They're very simple, they're very fast, right? So they're attractive from certain perspectives um, and using them in low dimensional settings, for example, to do Monte Carlo integrals of uh, you know low dimensional integrals, um, they can be perfectly reasonable, but um, you wouldn't necessarily want to trust them in the context of a challenging problem. So how can we build a better generator? Well, what you could do is you could move away from this whole idea of generating a sequence of integers and then uh, turning those into um, numbers on zero one. You could instead switch your attention to generating binary sequences because at the end of the day, computers work with uh, you know binary sequences anyway. So we could just focus on a so-called bit stream of zeros and ones, and we can think about how could we generate a random bit stream. Right, so um, there are lots of bit stream generators. Uh, we'll look at a class of them that are quite nice called shift register generators. Um, and the idea is you just have, um, it's a, you know, it's an extension of the idea of linear congruential generators. You just take a sequence of bits and you kind of shuffle them around in a way that appears random. It's a set of deterministic rules again, but they appear random. So let's, let's have a look at a XOR shift generator. So we start with 64-bit uh, chunks, okay? So that's just an array of 64 zeros and ones. Uh, you initialize uh, your generator, uh, not to a set of zeros, to, to something else. Uh, it shouldn't really matter what, but you know, you, you just initialize it to something. Uh, and then you have an iteration that gives you a new sequence of noughts and ones. And what does that iteration look like? Well, it actually consists here of three steps. So first of all, you XOR the number with um, the uh, right shifted sequence. Uh, and then you overwrite your X. Then you take that new X and XOR it with a left shift shifted sequence by an amount B and store that in X, then you XOR it with a right shifted sequence by an amount C and restore it. So you're using left and right shifts by differing amounts. You're XORing it with your the X that you started with and you're overwriting your previous X. And it's this sequence of three operations that is giving you your next iteration in your random number sequence. So just to be clear, um, this um, carrot, carré or carrot notation uh, is denoting, denoting uh, XOR in this context. Uh, these are your left and right shift operators and the, the A, Bs and Cs here are the amounts by which you shift. 
So some example values are A is 21, B is 35, and C is 4. Okay, and remember this is in the context of a 64-bit uh, register. So if you're yeah a bit rusty on your, your binary operators, um, what does it mean to shift left? Well, you take your X, you shift it left one. That means you discard your leftmost uh, digit and you pad on the right with a zero. Similarly, shifting two is you do it again, padding again on the right with a zero. Shifting right is the same, but backwards. Uh, and this XOR is exclusive OR, so it's one or the other, all right? That is, it's a one where the bits disagree and it's a zero where they agree. So this XORing operation is very important in the context of random number streams. Generally, we'll come back to that in a second, but that's really what's going on here is that you're using this XOR operation in order to um, mix things up a bit in a random way. And um, XOR has some good properties in that context that we'll discuss a bit more later. But from our point of view, it's just a bunch of scrambling operations. Um, we don't really care where they come from. We don't really care uh, sort of why it works. We just want to know that it does work and we want to test to see if it does work. Uh, notice that because these are very simple binary operations, they're the kinds of things that computers do incredibly fast. So this generator is uh, uh, incredibly fast, right? So if you need a fast generator, this kind of thing is, uh, is very good. So this one uh, does have a, a full period of two to the 64 minus one. It passes this battery of tests. Um, so this is all good. Um, because you can see it's a very similar idea to the um, linear congruential generators. It's just now operating on binary sequences rather than integers, but you can see that it has the same kind of structure. And so it actually has some of the same issues that um, you can have these granularity problems um, sometimes uh, but for many purposes these kinds of generators are very good they are very fast uh, so you know it's a decent generator well worth knowing about so how do we do better yeah so in general, we'd say these shift-based generators are, are a bit better than linear congruential generators, but they have some similar problems, um, but they're very fast. So what if we just wanted better randomness um, and we didn't mind paying a little bit of a computational cost to have better randomness? Well, one thing you could do is combine multiple random number generators. And we've already hinted at this idea of this XOR operation being useful in this context. So the idea of XOR is that um, in some sense, you can't make a random number generator worse by XORing it with another independent sequence. Yeah, so you can sort of prove this to yourself uh, relatively straightforwardly. If you have a, a true random sequence of zeros and ones, and you XOR with it any independently determined sequence. It could be deterministic, it could be stochastic, it could be a little bit random, not random, it doesn't matter. If you have a random sequence and another sequence that has been generated independently of that sequence, uh, as I say, deterministically or otherwise, like it could be a sequence of ones, it could be a sequence of zeros, it could be an alternating stream of zeros and ones, it doesn't matter. The resulting sequence will still be entirely random. So there are, there are two ideas behind that. So one is that you can not make your random number generator worse by XORing something else into it. And if you have a random sequence that you're not sure is very random by XORing in another random sequence, you can really sort of only make it better. Yeah. So by taking multiple generators and XORing them together, that gives us a nice way of, uh, you know, taking the, the kind of the best aspects of multiple generators and uh, getting something even better. Yeah. And so lots of uh, combined generators uh, work in this way. And so a well-known one is this so-called Witchman Hill generator. Um, it's uh, available in R and in various other places. It's one of the standard generators. And that's, um, yeah, that's an example of a compromise that's um, a little bit more expensive than a simple shift generator, but has better randomness properties. And so that 
probably is a price worth paying in many cases. The other option is to just use a more sophisticated generator. So you can take the idea of those uh, XOR generators uh, and extend it. And in particular, what you can do is you can maintain a history of your recent bit patterns. So rather than just using the previous bit pattern in order to generate the next, you can keep a history of the last few bit patterns and scramble those into the mix as well. And that can lead to generators with the uh, very, very long periods indeed. So the kind of best known example of this is the so-called Mersenne Twister. Um, and so its name comes from the fact that its uh, period is a Mersenne prime. It's two to the one nine nine three seven minus one. And that is a very, very big number. Okay, so this uh, generator is relatively cheap. I mean, it's not one of the, the cheaper ones. Right? So it does have a, an additional uh, computational expense compared to say a, an XOR shift generator but um, it's a, a very very high quality random number generator with a very long period and so if you're doing very serious Monte Carlo simulations and you really need a, a reliable generator with a very long period um, this is a good choice um, and again it's actually now the default generator in R and um, it's, it's in all of the standard libraries uh, for other languages as well. So um, if you want a sort of default generator that's safe, uh, reasonably performant, not super fast, but, but safe, then the Mersenne Twister is a good uh, default choice. Try and avoid using um, black box generators that you don't know where they come from. They used to be really terrible in general. Now, things are getting better because people are getting more serious about random number generators and cryptographic random number generators are more common now, etc. So uh, it's not quite like the old days, but still be very suspicious of any black box random number generator. Make sure you know what it is and that it's suitable for statistical applications. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and, and make sure you're happy with it. If you're doing high dimensional integration, it's even more important that you know what your generator is doing and that you know it's decent than if you're doing some very, you know, one dimensional Monte Carlo integral or something like that. So generally speaking, the more challenging the problem, the higher dimensional the problem, the more random numbers that you need, the more important it is that your generator has good properties. Uh, if you want a sensible default, as uh, I've mentioned, the Mersenne Twister is probably a good uh, choice. Um, if you want um, a very fast generator, then the Mersenne Twister isn't one of the fastest. So um, if you really know that your problem is um, constrained by the speed of your random number generator, right, that the random number generator speed is a bottleneck, then you can consider switching back to a faster generator such as an XOR shift uh, if you check carefully that it is good enough for your application. Um, but most problems, there's so much other stuff going on in your code that it's actually quite rare that the speed of the generator the random number generator is really the bottleneck so before you switch to some faster generator than a Mersenne twister uh, check that actually that really is a, a significant bottleneck in your code and that switching to a faster generator will really make a difference because in many cases it won't in which case you may as well stick with a Mersenne twister because that's a good safe choice um, yeah, I mentioned uh, tangentially uh, cryptographic generators. Um, they, they're solving a different problem. Um, so they are not interested in the problem of does your random number generator have good uniformity properties that makes it very suitable for doing high dimensional Monte Carlo integrals, right? That isn't the problem they're interested in or solving at all. Uh, they want their generators to have a very different property, which is that by observing a sequence, it's very hard to you know back calculate what the generator is doing and therefore predict the next value. Okay, although it's not totally unrelated, it is largely unrelated to the statistician's problem. And so they're usually uh, very much over-engineered uh, relative to statistical purposes, but also they're just solving a different problem. So uh, I would generally say that a cryptographic generator is not the kind of thing you particularly want to use in the context of uh, Monte Carlo simulation.
So that's the uniform not one problem, right? We now will take it as read that we have a way of generating uniform not one random quantities. Um, how do we get uh, random quantities from other distributions? Well, uh, the simplest approach is just to think about inversion, that is uh, inversion of the CDF. So why is that? Well, if X is from a distribution with CDF capital F, then uh, it's a one-liner to show that um, the CDF function applied to the random variable X has a uniform not one distribution. Like I said, it's just a one-liner based on the, um, the definition of the CDF. And so if our inverse function uh, is the inverse of that, then we can start with a uniform not one. We can apply the inverse function and we can get a random variant from X. Um, and if you're a little bit clever about what you mean by an inverse, you can even set this up so it works perfectly well for uh, discrete random quantities as well. So the inversion method is very, very general, uh, but it does rely on you having the inverse CDF in a reasonably tractable form, which of course isn't the case for many uh, random quantities. Uh, but if you are in the happy situation where you have the inverse CDF, the, the so-called quantile function, uh, then this is a, a very general purpose technique for simulating random quantities from that distribution. So here's just an example of generating normal not one random quantities, um, which is kind of interesting. So we're gonna take a million uh, uniform not one random quantities. We're going to apply the QNorm function. So that is the inverse CDF in R, the, the so-called quantile function for the normal. And so that should give us a bunch of standard normal random quantities. And we can see how long that takes, not very long at all. Um, But as we've said, getting the the um, quantile function for lots of distributions is problematic. Sometimes it's computationally expensive. So very often there are much better ways of generating the random quantities other than uh, inversion. Um, so for a standard normal, for example, you might know of things like the Box-Muller method uh, for simulating normal random quantities, etc. That's uh, one standard way of doing it. There are often rejection sampling algorithms for doing this sort of thing. Uh, so there are often uh, better, faster, more efficient methods for generating random quantities than just using simple inversion. But curiously, if you actually do this with a normal, so we just get uh, a bunch of uh, random normals from R, you can see that actually that it's not really any faster. I mean, technically on that particular run, it was actually slightly slower to use the built-in R norm function than it was to apply the quantile function. So generally that won't be the case. Um, here it's it's marginal because um, the Q norm function in R is also uh, very highly optimized. Um, but, but in general, there will be much better ways for generating quantities from other distributions than simple naive application of inversion. But as we've just seen, uh, if you've got a good quantile function, then um, it's a pretty general strategy and works pretty well, okay? So, but we're, we're starting to stray out of the, the realms of this, this uh, course. Um, this is more the subject of computationally intensive methods. So that's uh, pretty much all I wanted to say about random number generators. Uh, this book by Gentle uh, is uh, slightly ironically a nice gentle introduction to uh, random number generation and Monte Carlo methods. Um, that's quite a nice book. If you want to know more about the Messane Twister, there are some links. If you want to know more about the XOR shift generators, there's a link there. Um, the die hard tests are, are interesting and worth knowing about, though there are uh, some more modern alternatives these days as well. Um, and uh, Ripley's book I've already mentioned, I, I think this is, although it's a little bit dated in places, I still think this is a nice introduction to the methods of stochastic simulation. All right, so that's random number generation.